America in Another World, by Ron the Black Cat. Chapter 1. Hmm. Not this, nor that. The inhabitants in this one are still using flint spears. That's not going to be useful at all. No intelligent creatures in that one. A few later. What the? These are somewhat advanced and look similar to my mortals but they are not acceptable. They look terrifying, and what's with their armor? They even have a god emperor of some sort, not using them. Aha, uh -huh. finally, this one seems fairly advanced, not super terrifying, and the mortals in this one look similar to my mortals. I suppose I should investigate it. I can only use a part of it. Later, I could just, uh, use one so I don't disrupt much. I'm pretty sure whoever is in charge of this world won't mind, right? That one seems to be the most powerful one according to this thing that these mortals call the internet, let's just use that. Later. Ah, this is far more complicated than I thought, why did they place their military all over this world? I have to make sure that I summon them so that they won't collapse the moment they get to my world. Well, this internet thing is quite useful in making sure I summon everything. July 18, 2019 AD. Heaven. Um, God, what is it, my child? I think you have to look at this. God looks down on earth. 0505 July 18, 2019 CE, Washington DC, United States of America. The sun was peeking out of the horizon on a seemingly normal day in the United States of America. Since it was about an hour before the rush hour, the streets of its capital made little sound. On a table near a bed, a phone rang. What now? I still have. The person on the bed opened his mouth in a yawn and rolled his body towards the clock that was on the table, an hour and a half. He reached out with his hand and grasped his phone. He slowly put it to his ear. Ugh. What is it? This better is important. You know how I like to sleep. The voice over the phone line sounded worried. Mr. President? It's urgent. We need you in the situation room now. Sounds like my chief of staff, John Wills. Are we getting nuked, invaded, or is there some kind of crisis? No but. Not important. The president hung up without waiting to listen. Give me 15 minutes. He mumbled to no one as he closed his eyes. 15 minutes later. The president was sitting on his chair in the situation room. The situation room was a room with one big table and multiple chairs surrounding it. There were also TVs on the walls around the Situation Room and one large TV situated in the back. There were also other rooms around the Situation Room which consisted of officers who were receiving information and processing it. The National Security Council and advisors were all there in their seats and the officers were present in the other rooms. The National Security Council consisted of President Ronel Hay, Vice President Maxwell Woggs, Secretary of State Katerina Clifford, Secretary of Defense Carlson Roberts, Secretary of Energy Kobe Elliott, and Secretary of Homeland Security Lenny Clark. The advisors were the Chief of Staff John Wills, National Security Advisor Blair Howards, and Homeland Security Advisor Taylor Sky. Mr. President, you can't always ignore us. John sounded very annoyed. The President sighed. I know John but you should get used to the fact that I like to sleep. The president looks at everyone in the situation room. What is it this time? The last time I was called because of urgent matters was when the Middle East was falling apart. What is so important that you have to call me during the most important part of the day? My bedtime. There was a tense silence for a few seconds before John decided to continue talking. Sir. It's going to be hard to explain but we think we might not be on earth anymore. After he said that, the president just sat there and stared at his chief of staff for a good minute. John. It might be easier if you look at our satellite images. John swings his chair towards the main TV and turns it on. It showed a planet that was similar in size and shape to earth. The president stares at the image. What the? That seems just like, wait. What's with all these continents? Hmm, that continent seems like North America. Canada looks a bit weird and Mexico doesn't exist. Are you telling me that that's the United States of America? Sir, that's what our satellite indicates. This is not going to be good. 
Sigh. Great. Just great. More sleepless nights. Okay. So what do we know? Well, let's at least gather as much info as we can. Well, we are unable to communicate with any foreign countries but we still have all of our satellites. That's confusing. If we are on another planet, why do we have our satellites? How about the satellites of other countries? It seems that only ours are in space. What is this? This does not make any scientific sense. It could make more sense if a part of the stuff in space and a part of the Americas to be transported to another place. Like an anomaly that affected that area. However, our satellites are quite scattered. We have about 900 of them in space. It's weird since only specifically American satellites got transported. Anything else? If I may, Carlson, the Secretary of Defense, was waiting patiently for John to finish. Go ahead, Carlson. Well, it seems all of our major foreign military bases are spread out in a pattern across what used to be Canada. So in addition to the satellites, our foreign military bases were transported with us. This gets stranger by the minute. How many is that and what do you mean by spread out in a pattern? It should be about 50 in total. Also, it seems that our men and equipment in minor foreign military installations, on the battlefield, and stationed in other areas that are not in the United States somehow wound up near where the major military bases are. The pattern seems to be naval bases on the coast, army bases inland, and air force bases further inland. They all seem to have a similar distance to each other. Moreover, the ships that we had deployed overseas have reported that their positions have changed to our coasts. They are also spread out in a pattern. So what I am getting here is that even though the United States is not on Earth anymore, anything that belongs to it, even if it wasn't in the United States, also got transported here. It's as if someone picked up the United States and its possessions and deliberately moved it to another world. The phone in the situation room started ringing. The vice president, Maxwell, picks it up because he was the closest. Okay. So all of the foreign ambassadors disappeared. Okay. I will relay this to the president. He puts the phone down. What is it, Maxwell? Sir. It seems like all the foreign diplomats in the embassies in the United States have been replaced by their American counterparts. People who weren't American citizens were probably transported out. So basically, the assets and the people of the United States from Earth were transported to this place. Except for probably a few minor military buildings and embassies, we can assume that. Huh, this solves quite a lot of our issues, like our debt to other countries, and creates much more. Taylor, do you think we might need to impose martial law to keep order? Most likely not, this shouldn't cause major panic and the police can deal with minor unrest. The states themselves can send in the National Guard if things get too out of hand. Well, I suppose I need to prepare for a cabinet meeting and address the nation. How much information should be released? Sigh, this is going to be a long day. More nights of not much sleep. 0630 July 18, 2019 CE. The TV crews from all major networks were swarming the North Lawn. The president was in front of his podium with the North Portico in the background. He was about to address the nation on the unprecedented and bizarre situation that had occurred. My fellow Americans, as of 5 a.m. Eastern Time today, the United States finds itself in an unprecedented and bizarre situation. Although we cannot confirm everything yet, we seem to have been transported into a new world. The following information is what we currently know. We seem to have lost all contact with our previous world and all non-US citizens have disappeared. However, the people and possessions of the United States, even the ones not on US soil, have been transported along with us. Our military bases in foreign countries have been transported to the lands we considered as Canada in our previous world. All American satellites are currently in the space of this world. My fellow Americans, I ask for all to remain calm as your government seeks more answers. May God bless the United States of America and may he watch over us in this new world. 0645 July 18, 2019 CE 
Inside the cabinet room, the president and most of his cabinet were convened for an emergency meeting. The cabinet included members of the National Security Council and the chief of staff. The cabinet meeting also includes the secretary of the treasury Stephen White, attorney general Lara Wallace, secretary of the interior Kirby Richmond, secretary of agriculture Irving Patton, secretary of commerce Michelle Su, secretary of labor Solomon McClark, secretary of health and human services Brady Saunders, secretary of housing and urban development Francis Moody, secretary of transportation Danielle Paul, Secretary of Education Leon Crawford, and Secretary of Veteran Affairs Alvin Johns. The President looked at everyone. As all of you have been informed, we have been transported into a new world. Because of this, we have many urgent issues we need to solve to survive in this new world. Irving, can we sustain our population using our production? Mr. President, I can guarantee you that the United States has a rate of more than 100% food self-sufficiency. However, we might be unable to produce some exotic crops. Hmm, we might be able to find some exotic crops in this world. Good. Michelle and Solomon, some of our companies are going to be hit hard by this. Especially the ones that have foreign branches. Also, some businesses might be hurt by a lack of workers. I need you two to sort this out. Both spoke at the same time. Understood, sir. Krilson. I need the bases that are in. The president paused. I suppose we can't call it Canada anymore. He pondered a bit. An alternative name. The Northern Frontier. I want the bases in the Northern Frontier to explore their surrounding area. We are already doing that, sir, Krilson said confidently. Good. Now, the most important part of this meeting. Kobe, can you tell us our oil consumption and production? I'm afraid that I might need to announce to the American people that there will be a restriction on oil use. We currently consume about 19 million barrels per day and we produce only about 9.3 million barrels per day. That's a deficit of about 9.7 million barrels per day. We will need to greatly increase our production to keep up with the consumption. I recommend that as of right now we tap into our strategic petroleum reserves. It's also a good thing that we have about 36.5 billion barrels of proven oil reserves. So we need to ramp up the production from our oil companies. That's true, sir. Good. Well on to the next important resource. In addition to our oil issue, we probably need to ramp up mining of metals since we can't import them anymore. Probably easier said than done. The environmentalists are not going to like either of these. Well, desperate times call for desperate measures. That reminds me. I haven't eaten breakfast yet. The president immediately stood up and bolted out the door. The secretary of energy looked at everyone in the cabinet room. What was that about? Everyone looked at each other and shrugged. 0600 July 18, 2019 CE. Suburbs of Nashville. United States of America. The alarm was beeping like there was no tomorrow. Jack groggily got out of his bed like a zombie after he shut down his alarm. Sigh, another day. 45 minutes later. After brushing his teeth, taking a shower, and getting dressed, Jack went into the kitchen to cook his breakfast and to make his coffee. A day like any other. Jack brought his cup of joe and his breakfast to the table in front of the couch and reached for his remote. I wonder if anything interesting is happening today. I still have 25 minutes before I need to go. Jack turned on the TV in front of the table and started with his breakfast. Many Americans feel apprehensive about the future. Scientists are very baffled at how this could have occurred. For more information on the ongoing situation, we now go live to our White House correspondent Jimmy Hess. Jimmy. Can you explain what the president is doing about this situation? Jack was savoring his bacon when the news caught his attention. We should be hearing from the president again very soon. There was a long pause. Thank you, Jimmy, for the viewers that are just tuning in for the 7 o'clock morning news. We will replay the president's address to the nation. Jack started sipping his coffee while listening closely to the TV. Eastern time today. God bless the United States of America and may he watch over us in this new world.
Jack took the time to process that like a computer that just downloaded a massive file. He then proceeded to stare at the TV in disbelief before ejecting the coffee that was still in his mouth. What the fuck? New world? What do they mean new world? Jack fumbled for his remote and started frantically switching through the channels on the TV. It was all about the same situation. Holy shit. This better is an April Fool's joke. It's already past April. Jack then noticed that he spat all of his coffee onto his pants and table. After tidying up, Jack picked up his phone and started dialing his main man Jerry. After a short ring, Jerry picked up. Jerry, man. Have you seen the news? Of course I have. You always seem to be behind on what's happening. Do you know what the exact fuck is happening? Well, it seems like the whole world has gone crazy. According to the news, Mexico is now just an ocean and Canada disappeared. My family also can't contact my grandparents in England anymore. Fifteen minutes later, Jack exited his apartment building and got into his car. I'm going to be late but I'm pretty sure the boss wouldn't mind. I mean like this weird shit that's happening should be enough explanation for why I am late. Sigh. I wish that this was just another day. Jack turned on his engine and started to back out. Life seemed somewhat normal even with all this going on. Maybe it is another day. 1059 July 18, 2019 CE. Rose Barracks, Germany. Sergeant Kevin Vander was sitting in his room in the barracks and reading a book. He was a driver for an M1126 infantry carrier vehicle or a striker ICV for short. He was part of the Iron Troop of the 3rd Squadron Wolf Pack of the 2nd Cavalry Regiment of the 7th ATC, Army Training Command, under the Usurer, United States Army Europe, that was based in Germany. Today was just like any other day and it was going to be chow time soon. 1113, July 18, 2019 CE, Rose Barracks, Germany, this romance novel is great. I never thought that I would actually like it. Thought it was dumb that Brian actually liked this. All of a sudden, the base alarm started blaring. Huh? What the? The PA system came on. All personnel, report to your units. All personnel, report to your units. Holy shit. Are the Russians invading? Kevin rushed out of his room and bolted down the stairs. Some of the soldiers that were goofing off in the barracks were already running down the stairs. Although it wasn't full panic, there was an air of urgency. When Kevin exited the barracks, men were running around like ants. Kevin started going towards his troops area, something doesn't feel right. Kevin paused and looked up at the sky, what the? Although it was supposed to be nearly noon, the sun wasn't up in the sky. Instead, it seemed like the sun was just barely coming out of the horizon. It's already past 11 am. The sun is supposed to be up there and not down there. It isn't supposed to be rising like the early morning. What the hell is happening? I hope this isn't because of the Russians. Kevin arrived at his troops designated area. He went to where his section was. Brandon Watson, a staff sergeant and the commander of Kevin's striker, and the infantry squad of his striker were there. Kevin's captain, the commanding officer of the Iron Troop, was at the front of his troop. The other troops of his squadron were on his troops' sides with their captains. At the very front and middle was the lieutenant colonel, the commanding officer of the entire 3rd squadron. Once everyone was there, the lieutenant colonel started speaking. Men, our guards have noticed a sudden and unexplainable change in our surroundings. We have also noticed the disappearance of our friends, the Germans. However, we are still able to contact Washington. While the colonel is talking with high command, he has ordered the second squadron and our squadron to secure a surrounding perimeter about 1.5 miles away from the base. The regimental engineer squadron will be setting up fortifications about one mile behind you once the perimeter has been established. Your job after establishing the perimeter is to protect the engineers while they set up the fortifications. The 4th Squadron will do recon a while after the perimeter is established. 1150-0450 July 18, 2019 CE. Rose Barracks, Germany somewhere far north of Michigan. 
Kevin was sitting in his striker and looking out of the driver's hatch. Their squadron had secured the planes that were east of the base about 15 minutes ago. The second squadron had secured the planes a bit outside of the forests that were far west of the base. The engineers should have started work already on the fortifications behind them. Kevin learned about what was happening by listening to the comm channels. According to the other soldiers who somehow caught wind of what the brass was saying, we were transported to another world along with the other bases and the United States of America. We also seem to be somewhere north of Michigan in what used to be Canada. That would explain why the sun was just rising. I'm pretty sure that the Russians or the Chinese, maybe even aliens, might have used some secret advanced technology to get rid of us. The infantry was standing around in front of the strikers and talking. Brandon, the staff sergeant, was on the commander's hatchboard looking at the horizon. 0550 July 18, 2019 CE, Rose Barracks, Northern Frontier, far north of Michigan. Kevin overheard from the radio that part of the 4th Squadron will arrive in about 15 minutes to do recon outside of the established perimeter. It was already an hour and everyone was as bored as hell since nothing was happening. There was a sense of tension that was mostly dissipated by now. All the squadrons that were protecting the engineers were ordered to retreat behind the fortifications once the engineers were done. It seemed quite calm even though the surroundings seemed like a foreign country. All of a sudden a loud noise was heard in the distance. Huh, that sounded like a bird. Everyone in the area turned and looked towards the distance. For a bit, there was nothing. Then, a continuous and loud sound began. It sounded like a huge flock of birds. Out of the horizon, a single bird appeared. It seemed like a normal bird. Kevin could see it all the way from here and its size is too normal for that loud of a noise. Wait, if we could see it all the way from here. Before Kevin knew what was going on, the font bird propelled itself, dived, and landed in front of the infantry. Holy Bloody Mary and Jesus Christ. It was a colossal, red, and vulture-like bird that was about two stories tall. Everyone was stunned and bewildered for a second. One of the infantrymen, Ruth, was standing right below it. Ruth look out. Someone shouted and everyone noticed that the bird had its beak open. The bird's head dived down and lifted Ruth with its beak. Then the bird pointed its beak upward. Ruth's head was in the bird's beak and everyone could see that his legs were out of the beak and flailing around. Then he was swallowed. Holy shit. Open fire open fire open fire. M4 carbine S and M249 saws from the infantry started lighting the giant bird up. The bird reared its head like it was in pain and started screeching. Brandon got back into the striker and the striker's .50 cal M2 Browning machine gun started firing. The other strikers followed. The .50 calories went through the bird-like paper. The bird was cut down in an instant. It was a bit of an overkill since they didn't expect this to happen. It seemed as if it was over just then and everyone sighed in relief. Then the radio crackled. It was the captain of our troop who was in another striker. We got more company incoming. All striker units fire when within range. Infantry retreat behind the strikers and open fire if the birds get close enough. The 4th squadron is coming in as reinforcement. ETA about 5 minutes. Ah oh shit, Kevin looked through the driver's viewport and saw that a huge flock of birds was drawing near. Their fur color was different from the first and was bright orange. It seemed like a fire was moving toward them from the sky. The rifles and machine guns started firing again. It was the music of the battlefield. Although they were cutting them down by what felt like the hundreds, the birds were getting closer. They had started to back up in order to get some distance. The birds didn't seem terrifying but the amount of them was overwhelming. The strikers poured heavy machine gun fire into the flock while the infantry did whatever they could with their rifles and light machine guns. The infantry was more effective when the birds closed in. When a bird started a dive, Multiple small arms fire ripped it apart. The birds in front of the massive flock faced hail upon hail of .50 calories from the strikers which tore through the birds. Then all of a sudden, explosions rocked the air. Several birds fell out of the sky at the same time. 
Behind the third squadron, there was the fourth squadron striker MGSs with their 105mm cannons. The striker MGSs had loaded M1040 canister shots which were extremely lethal to massed assaulting infantry. In this case, it seems to be quite lethal to massed assaulting birds. Additional 4th Squadron strikers armed with .50 calories also arrived. Just in damn time Kevin's staff sergeant commented. Chapter 2. 0615 July 18, 2019 CE. The fight only lasted about 20 minutes before the birds started to retreat. With the help of the 4th Squadron, the 3rd Squadron was able to hold off against the birds without suffering heavy casualties. The birds got close multiple times but the immense firepower that hammered the birds was enough to ensure that the birds didn't swoop down on them. The canister shots were extremely effective and tore through multiple birds with every shot. Kevin sighed in relief. Well seems like the days are going to be more exciting now. Those damn Russians transporting us to another world. I'm pretty sure this is all those damn commies fault. Brandon was looking down at Kevin. You aren't thinking that this is the Russians' fault, are you? Well, of course it is. What else could it be? Every damn time with you. It's not always the Russians. Then what about aliens? A massive sigh came from Kevin's staff sergeant. 0720 July 18, 2019 CE. Washington, D.C., United States of America. I just finished my breakfast. What is it this time? The president was back in the situation room after being forced to quickly eat his breakfast. I told you guys I will be back once I finish calmly eating. Mr. President, this is extremely urgent and we can't wait for you to finish your breakfast. John, you have literally dragged me to this room twice today. Now, what is it? Well Mr. President, it seems like giant birds are attacking our military bases in the northern frontier and the towns on the border with it. Giant birds. We have some footage of one of these in Ogdensburg, New York. A shaky video that seems to be taken from a person's iPhone appears. A giant bird appears to land on a street near a Sunoco gas station. Police sirens are also heard in the background. Look at that. OMG, it's tearing up a house. The video cuts off. This is definitely not our world anymore, isn't it? How concerning is the current situation? I can imagine all the work I have to do now, sigh, well, it's my job and the American people are depending on me. I mean, I am dedicated to changing America for the better, but what is happening right now is ridiculous. Well, Mr. President, attacks like these are occurring at random places on the border. However, since it's usually only one bird, police are able to deal with it with small arms. On the other hand, our military bases inside the northern frontier are experiencing large numbers of these birds. Currently, most of them have fought them off with minimal casualties. We currently believe that casualties are well below 100. I suppose that this isn't that big of an issue. Increase the DEFCON level to 4 just in case. We also probably need to send in the National Guard to protect the border with the northern frontier and supply anti-air to our bases in the northern frontier. Chapter 3, Uncharted Territory 1300 August 22, 2019 CE Washington, D.C., United States of America It has been a little over a month since the United States had been transported to this world. People are still getting used to it but they have remained relatively calm and no major incidents have occurred so far. Problems with resources were being solved. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve was used for a short time while oil companies ramped up production. It was a good thing that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve had 713.5 million barrels of oil. President Ronnie Hayes, Secretary of State Katerina Clifford, Secretary of Defense Krilson Roberts, and Secretary of Energy Kobe Elliott had been talking for a while in the Oval Office. Mr. President, according to our experts, the northern frontier is a treasure trove of resources. My department and the experts believe that the region is rich with oil and a variety of metals. It's perfectly untouched land with a number of resources that are beyond our wildest dreams. That's pretty good news, Kobe. 
The negative impact we will experience in being transported to this world just lessened by tenfold. However, we still have to worry about those phoenix birds attacking. The president sighed. Krilson decided to interject. Ah, well, Mr. President. I believe that our military might be able to push back these phoenixes. Although they come in large groups, they can't launch a massive assault on us. And why is that? That's because it seems like these birds are separated into something like tribes. They seem to attack and destroy other tribes. Well, that sounds even better. Once we push the birds far enough, we can start exploring and extracting some of the resources that the northern frontier can offer us. I feel like I'm Thomas Jefferson. Ha. Huh. With that out of the way, let's talk about something more complicated. Krilson, your report on the satellite images. What satellite images? Oh for God's sakes Krilson, the images of possible civilizations on this planet. Ah, uh, oh yeah. Mr. President, through our satellite images of this planet, we were able to find civilization. However, we are unsure whether or not they are human civilization or some other possible being. Adjutant, the satellite images. Krilson's adjutant hands him a suitcase. Krilson opens it up and displays the satellite images on the table. Okay, as you can see here Mr. President, we have found multiple cities scattered throughout this world. This means that there are intelligent beings in this world. From our observation, all the continents are quite populated. One thing we noticed about them was how different the technology level was between them. What do you mean by different? Well, here's an image of a city on a continent that is about 6,000 or so miles south of us. As you can see, they have medieval castles and seemingly medieval cities. However, if you look at the coast of this continent, there seems to be a large amount of something that looks like World War I era coastal guns. In addition, if you look at this continent that is about 6,000 miles southwest of us, they seem to be in the World War I era. What is with this disparity? Well, we believe that the more developed nations might be safeguarding their technological advancements from spreading to the less developed nations. It's like how Great Britain during the Industrial Revolution tried to prevent their technology from spreading. However, in this world, it seems that the developed nations have been more successful. The president considered things and directed a question at the Secretary of State. Hmm. So how are we supposed to approach these nations? Well, Mr. President, we aren't quite sure. Heck, we aren't even sure if they are human. For all we know, they could be intelligent insects. I'm pretty sure that if we try to approach them, we will be fired upon. There seem to be a lot of hostile states. As you can see by the coastal guns of the continents south of us. In addition, if you look at the continent that has World War I era technology, you can clearly see a massive no man's land that cuts it in half. It seems to be more militarized than the Korean DMZ. The president looked over the satellite images. Do you think it's a better idea to let them approach us? I highly doubt they have noticed us yet seeing that no one seemed to live on this continent because of those phoenixes. As of right now, I believe that it's for the best that we try to establish communications with the continent south to us seeing that they are the closest and are less of a threat. The only issue is that the fortifications on its coast is like the French Maginot Line from World War II except for with much more forts and no weak spots. We aren't sure if our ships will be fired upon if they try to get close. Might as well prepare Katerina. I want a couple of ships to depart within a week. I will give you whatever ships that you seem fit to try and meet with these people. Understood, Mr. President. 0500, early hour, quiet 71st, 195 AE, 1000 August 10, 2019 CE, Port of Stelsol, Kingdom of Albia, so in a continent. It was early hour at the Port of Stelsol, men were loading up a metal ship that was sitting in the port. Chief Mate Henry Rolf was running to his captain. Captain Raoul, what's happening? Why are we departing so quickly? We just came back from the Septentrio Magus Imperium yesterday. We got orders from the Magusians through the Magriff. One of their great Magus felt a disturbance on Formido. The questioning sailor who was running toward the captain stopped. 
The Formite Incontinent. Yes. What else? There's no other location by that name. Henry was visible with fear. Sir, why do we have to go there? None of us are going to survive if we get near Formido. Haven't you heard of those horrifying tales of giant birds devouring men and sinking ships? Orders are orders. The only reason that the Magasians even allowed me to buy this beauty was that I agreed to pay a high sum, keep the technology secret, and follow their orders when they needed us. The sailor sighed at his captain. Sir, couldn't we have just bought an armed so in a merchant ship? Why do we have to buy an armed merchant ship built by the Magasians? It's obvious. Soana ships are copied from 145 AE designs of Magasian ships that the Magasians gave to the League. This ship was built by the Magasians in 180 AE. There are massive differences. Look at its beauty and majesticness. No other Soani owns a ship this advanced. The captain started rambling about the greatness of his ship. Ah, captain. Hey, anyways, don't worry about it. We have guns around the ship to protect us. At most this is just a 30-day round trip. We only need to take a look at Formido and then return. We don't even need to land. 1000 August 26, 2019 CE, Washington DC, United States of America. After the United States was transported to this new world, the Navy decided to reorganize itself and split its ships into seven fleets that surrounded the United States and the northern frontier. Just a few hours ago, a ship was detected by the U.S. First Fleet. The First Fleet patrolled the ocean from Maine to the tip of Florida. The ship was detected miles off the tip of Florida. Through satellite imagery, the ship was identified as a late 18th early 19th century steamship. The president was once again in the situation room with his cabinet. People, this will be a very important event in U.S. history. Our first contact with people of another world. Although it isn't under our terms as we wanted it to be, we still have to meet them. We don't know if they will be hostile. We don't know anything. From our satellite images, we can only deduce that they may be inferior to us in technology. However, that might not be the case. We can't just base their capabilities on how they seem. Meanwhile, the USS George Washington and its carrier strike group were currently heading towards the steamship. 0500, early hour, quiet 87th, 195 AE, 1000 August 26, 2019 CE, about 40 miles off the coast of Florida. Captain Raoul was looking through a spyglass. One of the older and veteran sailors came up to him. Hey, Captain. What ya looking at? There's nothing out there. It all a calm. The captain looked at the bearded sailor. Doesn't it seem weird? What ya mean seem weird? Usually at this point, we should be able to spot some of those giant birds in the distance but I see none. Well Captain, we may be lucky. Maybe, maybe. The captain went back into the ship after looking for a while. At this time most of the sailors were relaxing and talking. None of them noticed the ships that were approaching them from the distance. 1009 August 26, 2019 CE. Rear Admiral, we have visual on the steamship. Rear Admiral, lower half, Kennedy looked towards the steamship that they were approaching. He was the commander of the carrier strike group that consisted of the Nimitz-class nuclear aircraft carrier that he was on a Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruiser, two Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyer, a Virginia-class nuclear attack submarine, and a supply ship. Rear Admiral Kennedy thought that the addition of the submarine was overkill. In reality, they probably only needed the aircraft carrier, destroyers, and the cruiser. Although it was only a single steamship, the higher UPS were being very cautious. 0507, early hour, Quiet 87th, 195 AE, 1015 August 26, 2019 CE. Captain, there is a big group of ships that are currently approaching us. The crew of the steamship started to take notice and ask questions. Why are there ships so close to Formido? Are those mock Imperium ships? Some started to feel uncomfortable. Turn back? 
If those are Mackian warships, we are done for. A clear and strong voice was heard. It was the captain. Everyone, get back to your stations. You are sailors of the kingdom of Albia, a part of the League of Soan. Have some pride and bravery. A short silence followed. Then Chief Mate Henry Rolf spoke up. Sir, those could be Mackian warships. Chief Mate, have some sense. What would a group of Mackian warships be doing so far away from their home? The Machians should still be tied up in a stalemate and uneasy peace with the Magasians. They won't send any ships to Formido if they don't have to. I get the feeling this related to disturbance that the Great Magus felt. We will close in on those ships. The captain looked towards the ships. Also Chief Mate Rolf, tell the Magriff operator to send a message to the Magasians. Tell the Magasians that we have discovered ships of unknown origins near the continent of Formido. The crew felt apprehensive but didn't ask any further questions. As the captain said, they were sailors of their kingdom and the Glorious League. Their apprehension grew as they got closer to the ships. The ships looked massive, especially the one in the middle. Their apprehension lessened a bit when they noticed that three of the ships had only what seemed to be a singular gun on each of them. The unidentified ships seemed to be a few poorly armed ships protecting a massive merchant ship. On the other hand, although their ship had eight guns placed around it and the unidentified warships were poorly armed, they were still outnumbered three to one when it came to fighting capable ship numbers. 1016 August 26, 2019 CE. Rear Admiral, Lower Half, Kennedy looked through his binoculars. Captain Jones, who was the commander of the USS George Washington, was looking to Rear Admiral, it seems like they noticed us, Admiral, it seems eat. I suppose we could try to get closer or we could send an RHIB. Sir, I'm against the getting closer idea, they might open fire on us if we get closer. I suggest we send an RHIB so they feel less threatened. Chapter 4, First Contact 0511, Early Hour Quiet 87th, 195A. 1022 August 26, 2019 CE. About 40 miles off the coast of Florida. As the steamship got closer, a smaller ship seems to have appeared from one of the armed ships. Look at that. They seem to be sending some people over. Captain Raoul looked through his spyglass. Let them approach us, we outnumber them and I don't see any weapons. 1022 August 26, 2019 CE. Petty Officer First Class Glenn Jackson was on the RHIB with 11 other seamen and petty officers. They were each carrying an M4 carbine rifle that they received from their destroyer's armory. They were on their way to the steamship. Remember, our job is to only tell them to follow our ships so we can get them to land and probably get them to some diplomat that flying into a port in Key West. Don't raise your weapons unless you're threatened. Yes, sir. Oh boy, I'm definitely not qualified for this. They should have sent some sort of diplomat or something. A few minutes later, they arrived and positioned their RHIB next to the steamship. A rope was thrown down to them. That seemed quite hospitable of them. Well, up I go. Ah, well, this was as expected. What greeted Jackson on the ship was a few men aiming what seemed to be ancient muskets at him. Jackson's men also got onto the ship and they raised their rifles upon seeing the situation. The moment was tense until a man that was dressed in what seemed like what a captain of a ship from the 18th century would wear stepped forward and offered what seemed to be a handshake. Huh. Seems like the handshake is multiversal, is multiversal a word? Jackson gladly shook his hand smiling. The 18th century captain smiled back. Nice to meet you. I'm Petty Officer First Class Jackson of the United States Navy. I came from one of the ships over there. He just stood there and stared at Jackson in confusion. What? Sorry, I didn't get that. Can you repeat that? What? Ah, uh, crap language barrier, of course? This is a different world. Um, do you understand me? Then the captain turned to someone next to him. Roly, try speaking the common language to them. What do I say, sir? 
Just tell them nice to meet you and see how he responds. The man that the captain talked to looked at us and spoke. Nice to meet you. Ah, uh, still not English but it sounds weirdly familiar. One of the seamen behind Jackson spoke up. Sir, I think that's Latin. Jackson looked behind him at the seaman that spoke up. The seaman explained. I learned it in high school. Then do you understand what they are saying? It seems like they said something along the lines of nice to meet you. I don't quite remember much about what I learned in Latin so I can't really speak it. Any of you guys know how to speak Latin? Jackson's entire team shrugged. Ah, oh, guess I could try gesturing. Jackson started pointing at the deck of the steamship and then pointing at the fleet. Then he started gesturing in a waving motion towards his fleet. This feels dumb. The captain was confused at first but something sparked in his eyes. He started by pointing to himself and then at his ship and then pointed towards the fleet. Jackson immediately nodded and hoped that he understood. 0515, early hour, quiet 87th, 195A, 1030 August 26th, 2019 CE. Captain Raoul watched as the weirdly uniformed men that came from those ships got off of his ship. A sailor piped up. What did they want Captain? I think they wanted us to follow them. Follow them. They may be trying to bring us to their base. I think we should follow. Another sailor joined the conversation. But Captain, it could be a trap. Discussion among the other sailors started to erupt. Some wanted to turn back while others wanted to sally forth for adventure. The captain raised his voice. They are too poorly armed to make this trap successful. We could stay a distance behind them but still follow. We were tasked with this job and I want to see it through. Chief Mate Rolf. Yes, sir. Have we gotten a reply from the Magasians? Seeing that our Magriff operator has yet to report, I believe it takes around 15 minutes to get a message to them using magic. 0820, early hour, quiet 87th, 195A, 1040 August 26, 2019 CE. Primo Polis, Septentrio Magus Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. A tired and haggard man was sitting in his chair looking over papers on his desk. Although he was only 51, he looked like someone who just turned 65. There was pounding on the door. Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Your Majesty. Colryu's Arstand, the fourth emperor of the Septentrio Magus Imperium, calmly replied. Enter, Your Majesty. Colryu's looked up from his papers. Yes, you have Cal. His personal messenger cut him off and started rapidly speaking. Wegetraport that theship we sent to Hadjot and had Sinothership not Macianus Butin Formido. Colryu smiled lightly and started chuckling. Your Majesty. His personal messenger was a fumbling young man named Robertus Casca. The main reason that he was Colerius's personal messenger was that he was fast. However, there was a problem. The problem was that he was fast at everything. Speaking included. But this made the day feel easier for Colryu's. Something calmed him about this overexcited and bumbling young man. Colryu smiled. Calm down, Robertus. I couldn't understand what you said. Now, what report? Uh, yes your majesty? I mean your majesty. Robertus started calming down. We got a message from the Albin ship that was sent to check out the disturbance that was felt by the Great Magus. It appears there was a group of mysterious ships there. They don't seem to belong to any known nation. It is possible they came from Formido and was related to the disturbance. Colryus was immediately interested. 1230 August 26, 2019 CE, near Key West, Florida. Rear Admiral Kennedy was standing in the bridge. When the team sent to establish contact with the steamship came back, they learned two things. First of all, it seems that the people on the steamship seem to speak Latin. Washington was informed about this. They are now trying to get a Latin translator to the diplomat in Key West. Second of all, their guns are even more ancient than the steamship. They seem to be using some type of matchlock musket. Now they were closing in on the Key West. 
It took them an hour longer than expected because of the slow speed of the steamship. It really seemed to be from the 19th century. 0615, mid hour, quiet 87th, 195 AE 1230 August 26, 2019 CE. The sailors had noticed the giant ship seemed to be much faster than their ship. It greatly confused them and they wondered if these weird ships came from one of the empires. No ship that big could be that fast unless it was from one of the empires. It couldn't possibly be from the Magasians since the Magasians asked them to come here. They hoped it wasn't a trap by the Machians. On the other hand, the lack of weaponry on the weird ships felt a bit reassuring. They also noticed that they were closing in on what seemed to be a small island with what seemed to be a city on it. The Magasians had given Captain Raoul many orders through the Magriff. First of all, Captain Raoul needed to observe these ships and learn more about them. Second, the Magasians wanted him to contact them immediately through the Magriff if these mysterious people lived on the Formidan continent. The Magasians also told Raoul to stay there if they lived on Formido. The Magasians would send diplomats that would arrive within seven days to establish relations with them and learn how they were able to live on Formido. From what Captain Raoul could see, it seems like they lived in a big city on an island that was very close to Formido. Rolf, tell the operator to tell the Magasians that they seem to live very close to Formido on an island. Yes, sir. 0623, mid hour, quiet 87th, 195 AE 1246 August 26, 2019 CE. Key West. Captain Raoul, Chief Mate Rolf, and a few sailors including Roly stepped down onto what seemed to be a port and surveyed the area. The giant ships also docked near them. Two men dressed in suits approached him. One of the men spoke. Hello, do you understand me? Roly was excited and quickly looked to his captain. Sir, they can speak common language. Roly then looked towards the man. Yes. The man shook hands with Roly. Nice to meet you. I'm Luke Hoffman. I'm a translator. I'm Roly Pollen. I'm also a translator. The man to my right is the captain of my ship, Jacob Raoul. He can't speak the common language. Common language. What you are speaking right now. Ah. Uh, the captain interrupted. Roly, what is he saying? Roly explained. When Roly stopped explaining, Luke started talking. To my right is a diplomat representing the government of the United States of America. Clark Underwood. United States of America. My country's name. Roly and Luke turned towards their superiors and explained what had just been said. The captain proceeded to shook hands with the diplomat. From this point on Luke and Roly translated whatever was said. As you know I'm Clark Underwood, a diplomat assigned to you. I will be representing my government. I hope we can get along. Likewise, I'm the captain of this ship. We are all being sent here by the request of the Septentri Omegas Imperium. All being? Septentri Omegas Imperium. Countries. My country's name is the Kingdom of Albia. We are allied with the Septentri Omegas Imperium. The Septentri Omegas Imperium may send actual diplomats to meet with you. We are only here because they requested us when their Great Magus felt a disturbance. Clark was confused. Great Magus? Disturbance? What is he talking about? I suppose I should just go along. Well, we don't know much about this world since we only arrived here about a month ago. We are Americans. The difference between how time was told was somewhat confusing but the translators were able to explain to each other what they were talking about. Arrived here only a third of a season ago. Yes, my country was inexplicably transported here from our world. Now it was Raoul's time to get confused. We ourselves don't understand what happened. Anyways, what are your current plans? My government will accommodate you in every way possible. Raoul decided to think about it later. We will be staying here for about seven days while the diplomats from the Magus Imperium travel here. Since you are staying here for a while, I suppose you can visit one of our bigger cities. Bigger city. We are currently in a small city called Key West. Raoul thought to himself. Well, there is no palace or castle or anything here. 
They must be taking us to their capital. Probably another island. If you don't mind, Luke and I will be boarding your ship. One of our ships will lead you there. How will the Magasian diplomats know where we are? Once our ships spot them, we will guide them over. Luke and Clark boarded the steamship and Captain Raoul told his crew to set sail and followed one of the armed American ships towards the city called Miami. Captain Raoul personally went to the Magriff operator and gave a message about what he found out. He also told the Magriff operator to ask for Magasian diplomats. 0300, early hour, quiet 88, 195 AE 2200 August 26, 2019 CE. Industropolis, Mach Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. Your Highness, we have gotten reports from the spies we sent to the Septentri Omegas recently. The new wireless telegraphy technology has proven its use. There is some information on here that may interest you. Desmond Industras, the fifth emperor of the Mach Imperium, was viewing the report that his servant gave him. His advisor was talking to him. A possible country on Formido, that's interesting. It is possible that they are descendants of the people that we sent there decades ago. Well sir, then that means that they should still be your subjects. Chapter 5, New Knowledge. 0900, End Hour, Quiet 87th, 195 AE 1800 August 26, 2019 CE. Near Miami. The steamship was passing by Miami towards Port Everglades under the escort of an Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer. Captain Raoul was staring at the skyscrapers of Miami in amazement. My angel, the only countries that are capable of building these are the Imperiums. Chief Mate Rolf disagreed. Well, sir, that's not quite true. The lost country of the elves could. It's said that they did it better. A young sailor interjected. Elves? They're just a myth made up by old geezers. Rolf looked toward the sailor. There are clear records of their existence. They lived on a continent near the Magus Imperium. Then where is the continent? They say it disappeared. So you have no proof. Captain Raoul wasn't listening and started muttering. They seem taller than the Tower of Magic in Primopolis. That's impossible. To build so much of these tall structures, this country may be on PAR with the Imperiums. The chief mate was listening closely. Captain, we can't just base their technology level on how tall their buildings are. 2000 August 26, 2019 CE. In a hotel near Port Everglades. Diplomat Underwood was in a hotel room. They had reached Port Everglades only about 30 minutes ago. Captain Raoul decided that it was late and he wanted to have dinner and rest. Underwood was thinking about accommodating them with hotel rooms but wasn't sure if it was a good idea. Captain Raoul said that he and his sailors were perfectly fine with staying on their ships. Underwood posted a lot of soldiers around the ship to protect them. It was also out of caution to make sure that none of them snuck out. Underwood agreed to let Captain Raoul and a few of his sailors tour the city tomorrow after an informational meeting. Underwood was under orders to gain information about this world from Captain Raoul. 0800 August 27, 2019 C. In a hotel meeting room near Port Everglades. Diplomat Underwood, Translator Hoffman, and a few other personnel were present on one side of a long table. Captain Raoul, Translator Paulin, Chief Mate Rolf, and a few other sailors were present on the other side. They had gone through introductions. Diplomat Underwood started to talk with the help of his translator. I suppose we should tell you about our country before you talk about your world. Sure. As you already know, my country is called the United States of America. We come from another world that we call Earth. Our land area is about 9,833,517 square kilometers. We have a population of about 300 million people. Our language is English. We are a constitutional federal republic or simply a democracy. Our capital city is Washington, D.C. which is a city further north of us. Captain Raoul having basically accepted the Americans' claim of being from another world since the existence of a country on this continent was supposed to be impossible, 
commented in surprise and disbelief. That's quite a large amount of people. Our most populated country is about 100 million. And we never had a successful democracy in history. You are also telling me that this isn't your capital city. Miami isn't a large or major city. We have much bigger cities than this. That's the basic information about our country. Can you tell us about your world? They could be lying. Even if it is true, they shouldn't be better than the Magus. Captain Raoul decided it was best to calm down and proceeded to explain and answer questions about his world. 1030 August 27, 2019 CE, in the hotel. With the informational meeting finished, Diplomat Underwood was getting them ready for their tour of Mamie. The other personnel had already written a report about what they had learned and sent it to the government. Captain Raoul had consistently praised the Septentrio Omegas Imperium during the informational meeting. During the tour, the group wasn't that surprised about the car seeing that there were cars in the Imperium but were interested in it. Captain Raoul, the only person among his group who has been to Primopolis and ridden a car, was surprised by its features and speed. Captain Raoul was surprised about how seemingly advanced the car was when compared to one from the Magus Imperium. The group with the exception of Captain Raoul was very fascinated by the city. Captain Raoul showed interest and commented about how it was similar to Primopolis. 1100 August 27, 2019 CE, Washington DC. Once again President Ronel Hay found himself in the Situation Room. At this point, I should just live here. Mr. President, we have received and compiled the report from the information that was given to us by the captain and crew of the steamship. Basically, we can split this information into three parts. The history, geography, current relations, and the technological capabilities of each country. Let's start with history. Secretary of State Katerina Clifford was giving the president and the rest of the department heads a briefing about what they had learned. The president interrupted. How long will this be? I have lunch at 12. It shouldn't take that long. Then by all means continue. The history of this world is centered around the Imperatoria continent which is located here. There was a big satellite image displaying the world. The Secretary of State pointed towards the large continent that was east of the United States. This world's lingua franca, the common language which is also known as the imperial language, and date system came from here. They have two eras like us. However, they call it before exploration, B for short, and after exploration, AE for short. B is counted like BCE while AE is counted like CE. I will be giving a crash course on the important parts of their history. On the Imperatoria continent at around 770 B, the empire was formed after the Kingdom of Gephoria slowly defeated the rest of the countries on the continent. Wait it was called the Empire? Nothing else. That's what they named it. At that time, no one on the continent was interested in venturing far on the ocean so they thought that the continent was the entire world. Anyways, for about 770 years, the empire prospered on the continent. At the year of zero, the empire decided to start exploring the world beyond the ocean out of curiosity. That's why the eras are named that way. When they started discovering different continents, they established friendly relations with the natives. Most of this didn't really have a major impact on the empire. Expect for one continent that wasn't located that far from the Imperatoria continent. The continent of the elves that is located here. The Secretary of State pointed to the ocean below the Imperatoria continent. The President was confused. Wait, that's just ocean. What continent? We are getting to that. The elves had a major impact on introducing magic to the Empire. The elves were also a bit more technologically advanced when compared to the Empire. The Empire learned a lot about the elves. However, around 50 AE, the elves kicked all humans off of their continent and disappeared. What do you mean disappeared? The entire continent was just gone the next day. According to the crew of the steamship, some say it never existed. However, there is clear evidence that the Empire discovered magic during their explorations. When their last king died with no heir in 76 AE, 
The empire was split in a civil war between the nobles that saw magic as evil and the ones that embraced magic. The nobles that embraced both magic and technology formed their own country called the Septentrio Magus Imperium. The nobles that embraced only technology and shunned magic created the Mach Imperium. They fought wars against each other and spread their influence to other continents. That would be the situation today. Next, we will be talking about the geography of this world. There are six continents in this world. The Imperatoria continent contains the Septentrio Magus Imperium to the south and the Magus Imperium to the north. Interestingly, according to our translator, Septentrio means north in Latin. It seems that to them, our north is their south while our south is their north. Before the president could question it, she moved on. The continent of Soan also known as Soana contains many kingdoms and is where the crew of the steamship is from. The eleven continent may or may not exist. The continent of Formido also known as Formidon is the continent we are on. Bame which is a continent north of Imperatoria. And the Insula continent which is this group of big islands. Through this lecture, she was pointing at the locations on the map. The president was getting very bored. Now we talk about relations. As I have said, this world seems to be centered around the Imperatoria continent. Which means the Mach Imperium and Septentrio Magus Imperium. Those two countries are sworn enemies of each other. The kingdoms on Soane are allied to each other in this alliance called the League of Soane. They support the Magus. The Kingdom of Bame, which is the main country on the continent of Bame, supports the Mach. According to the crew of the steamship, it's more like a satellite state. The relations of the Elven continent are unknown seeing that it disappeared. The Insula continent is like a battleground for the Imperiums. This is because they were no original humans on it. It's populated by an assortment of fantasy creatures. Orcs, goblins, beastmen, and many different creatures. Both Imperiums have sent forces trying to colonize it and are fighting over it. The continent that we are currently inhabiting originally had natives that were one of the least technologically advanced of this world. The Mach Imperium tried to subdue and colonize the natives. At first, they were successful but the phoenixes appeared and killed all humans that lived on the continent. According to the magicians of the Magus Imperium, it could have been summoned by a native who wielded a large potential of magic but couldn't control the phoenixes it summoned. That's an overall simplified version of the relations of the countries. The president's interests perked when he heard about the phoenixes. So basically, the phoenixes aren't natural. We could say that. I get the feeling that even if it is a fact that the phoenixes aren't supposed to exist, some will still complain about us killing them. On to the most important part. The technological capabilities. From our satellite images and the information we gained, we know a lot. The Imperiums have technology comparable to a peak World War I era nation. The Bame Kingdom is the Revolutionary War era. The Soana League is the Medieval era. So basically no one is really a threat to us. That should be guaranteed. The Secretary of Defense, Krilson, interrupted. There is one place that might have some issues. All eyes were on him. Ah, according to some people at my department, some battleships have enough armor to withstand a couple of hits from our ASMs, anti-ship missiles. What I'm most worried about would be if they have anything comparable to a World War II battleship. Those can probably withstand 10 or something ASMs. So what you're telling us is that our main weapon against other ships can't sink a World War II battleship. Well, yeah, but bombs, torpedoes, and anti-tank missiles can easily destroy a battleship. Well Krilson, tell me, do we need to produce a new type of anti-ship missile that can destroy a battleship? Ah, Mr. President, we could but we can just barrage the battleship with a ton of ASMs. After multiple hits, it should be disabled. Then why are you telling me this when we could disable it with ASMs? Eh, I'm telling you just in case. As long as the enemy doesn't have an absurd amount of battleships, we should be fine. 0400, early hour, quiet 94th, 195 A. 0800 September 2nd, 2019 CE. Port Everglades. Diplomat Jacques? 
I didn't expect you to come here. Captain Raoul, how are you doing? Chapter 6, The Imperiums. 0403, Early Hour, Quiet 94th, 195 A. 0806 September 2nd, 2019 C. Port Everglades, United States of America, Formidan Continent. When I heard you were involved, I requested to be sent here and the Emperor accepted. He even appointed me as the main diplomat. That sounds great. I can't thank you enough for allowing me to acquire that magnificent steamship. You don't have to thank me. We're friends. 0815 September 2nd, 2019 CE. Diplomat Underwood was leading Captain Raoul, Translator Paulin, and the Magasian diplomats toward a car. It seemed like Captain Raoul knows the Magasian ambassador. The Magasian was talking to him in the Albin language and seemed quite happy. The U.S. Navy had detected and guided the Magasian diplomat ship and its escorts to Port Everglades. Their diplomat Underwood greeted the Magasian diplomats. The Magasane ambassador introduced himself as main diplomat Jacques. There were two other Magasian diplomats. 0430, early hour, quiet 94th, 195 A. 0900 September 2nd, 2019 CE. In a hotel meeting room near Port Everglades once again, they were in the meeting room where they had held the informational meeting. This time, instead of Captain Raoul and his crew, it was Captain Raoul and the Magasian diplomats. After more basic introductions and diplomat Underwood explaining about his country, the main part of the meeting came. Our government is looking to establish relations with the Soana League and the Septentrio Magus Imperium. We want to send diplomats to your countries, in addition, we are also interested in the possibility of opening trade. Ambassador Jacques was the one who replied. Although we are interested in what you have just said, we have a more important matter that we want to attend to first. What is it? We would like to present an important treaty to your president. In order to get that to our president, we will have to look through it first. The treaty which was written in Latin was handed to Underwood who gave it to translator Hoffman. Hoffman looked through it. He turned to Underwood and started explaining. This seems to be a defense pact. It says that the Septentrio Magus Imperium will provide defense, necessary weaponry, and the men required to operate the weaponry to the signatories while the signatories will provide men, requested equipment, and requested goods to the Septentrio Magus Imperium for free during its times of war. The Septentrio Magus Imperium also requires a monthly payment for the defense. The specific payment and amount of troops will be discussed and negotiated depending on circumstances. Payment can range from slaves to gold. I don't think we can accept this. My country. Ambassador Jacques cut him off. I think we need to elaborate on the dangers you face. The mock Imperium will definitely target you. The Formido continent is a land full of resources. Full might be an understatement. It's overflowing with resources. Many decades ago, the Mock Imperium tried to wipe out the natives and acquire the resources so that they didn't have to bother with trading. If they know that you exist and that the giant birds are gone, they will definitely try to wipe you out to gain the resources. We fear that they may already know of your existence. My country knows that spies have infiltrated us but we don't know who. The spies may have already told them. We still don't think our country will require your help in a conflict with the Mock Imperium. Then allow me to elaborate on their fearful weaponry. The Septentrio Magus Imperium knows perfectly well the power of the Mock Imperium. We have so far fought four wars with them. They have all ended in a stalemate with one side gaining some land and nothing else. As of right now, our army is on PAR and in some areas superior to theirs. They have guns. Guns are. We know what a gun is. Ambassador Jacques paused for a second. That does make sense. With your ships and buildings, you should know what a gun is. Well, they use guns called bolt-action rifles and machine guns. Here are some pictures. Their machine guns, called the AG-2, are frightening. They have thousands of these and it can fire 500 rounds per minute. Ambassador Jacques was watching Underwood's expressions. 
It's either he's very good at keeping calm or that his country already has machine guns. Moving on. They have a menacing armored vehicle called a tank. Hey race a picture of their tank called the Industro 2. They have about a thousand of these. Its armor can go up to 22 millimeters thick. It is armed with a 40 millimeters cannon. Underwood just nodded his head. Ambassador Jacques was surprised. Do they have tanks? They probably do. My country's tanks are slightly inferior and we can't produce as many guns or tanks but our magic makes up for it. We have earth magic that can act as a gun or anti-tank weapon depending on how powerful the magus is. We also have shield magic to protect our soldiers. Basically, our army can face them as equals. Our navy may be somewhat inferior to the mock. However, that is fixed by my country's use of coastal guns. Coastal guns are offered to all of our allies as a way to defend themselves against the mock. The coastal guns are guaranteed for your country if this treaty is accepted. Mackian ships are truly terrifying. I have seen your country's ships but they are no match for the Mackian battleship when you compare their size and weaponry. This is a picture of their Desmond-class battleship. As you can see, it has 6 turrets with 12-inch guns. They have about 26 of these terrifying ships. I see. I see. That's it. Even our country was surprised and panicked when our spies found out about this ship. We spent a lot of resources improving these coastal guns so they have a chance against these battleships. We also have 5 barely comparable battleships and we don't have enough maguses that have enough power to put up a shield around the entirety of our ships. And all he's saying is I see? Ambassador Jacques started to look a bit unhappy. Diplomat Underwood noticed. Are you fine? Ah, uh, yes. I'm fine. They also have this thing called a plane that is able. We know what a plane is. Ambassador Jacques looked up and shook his head lightly. Sure. Here is a picture of their Maximil fighter aircraft. It is armed with two of their standard machine guns. Our country's air force is on PAR with them. Our flame-breathing dragons that can carry maguses can take down any mock aircraft. Ambassador Jacques paused in an effort to let it sink in a bit before continuing. Recently, through their increasing technological capabilities, they have been becoming more and more powerful. Our Imperium's technology may be lagging behind theirs but our magic greatly makes up for it. Our country is willing to help you in any way possible as long as you agree to this treaty. I will repeat what I said before, we will not accept it. Our country is not willing to immediately agree to a treaty that may drag us into a war. Ambassador Jacques tried to press on. You are making a terrible decision here. Our country also doesn't want a war with the mock. By signing this treaty, this ensures that we prevent the mock from invading you and growing stronger by gaining the resources of this land. If this land is so full of resources, wouldn't they try to start a war anyway? No, as long as they know that we are supporting you, they will think twice before starting a war with you. Our army and air force are a force that can't be ignored. Our country isn't willing to agree to something that may require us to fight your war. As of right now, our country is more willing to agree to a non-aggression pact. Can you at least give the terms of this treaty and these pictures to your president? We can do that but it is unlikely that he will agree. Though the non-aggression pact, trade, and our wish of sending diplomats to your country is still on the table. As of right now, we would like to establish a temporary embassy in this city and get a response to this treaty from your leader before we continue. That can be arranged. 0942 September 2, 2019 CE, Washington DC, United States of America, Formidon Continent. Yeah, we can't accept this. I mean it's ridiculous. We have to pay them monthly and give them a ton of free stuff during war. This also basically requires us to house foreign soldiers on our soil. At most, I can accept a mutual defense treaty. Thinking about it, the mutual defense treaty is still a bit overboard. The chances of it passing Congress are slim. I mean look at these weapons and their descriptions. The capabilities confirm the mock to only be a peak World War I nation. We can easily defeat them. The Secretary of State, Katerina Clifford, 
had given the president the details about the diplomatic meeting with the magazines. Diplomat Underwood, the diplomat we had down there, had suggested that we can at least give them a non-aggression pact. Well, let's see if they can agree to a non-aggression pact. 0500, early hour, quiet 94th, 195A, 1000 September 2nd, 2019 CE, in a hotel meeting room near Port Everglades. This area seems good. Well then, we can arrange that easily. The diplomats were discussing the location of the temporary embassy. Then the phone rang. Diplomat Underwood had sent the information about the meeting through others since he had to continue on with the meeting. Now the Secretary of State herself was directly calling him. He agrees that we can't accept it but we could try to negotiate a non-aggression pact. Diplomat Underwood nodded and hung up. Ambassador Jacques was curious. What was that? This is a telephone that my country commonly uses for long-range communications. I got a call from my superior about the treaty that you presented us. The Magasian diplomats were surprised that the Americans had a telephone and were interested in its weird shape. More and more, it seemed to them that this country called the United States of America may be on PAR with them or the mock. The buildings and some technology of the Americans seemed like it. Their reaction to the weapons also made sense if that was true. So what was the reply from your president? As I have said, we can't agree with your treaty. However, we can agree to a non-aggression treaty. Well, that is disappointing to hear. We will discuss this non-aggression treaty that you proposed in the future. Allow us to continue talking about establishing this temporary embassy. 0700, mid-hour, quiet 95th, 195A, Port Bannock, Mock Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. Two Desmond-class battleships, eight heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 20 destroyers were leaving port. Force A, a naval squadron put together by the Mock Imperium in a week, was steaming towards the Bame Kingdom in order to gather more forces. Seven days earlier, 0600, mid-hour, quiet 88th, 195A, Industropolis, Mock Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. Whether or not they are descendants of our people, I don't care. That continent is full of untouched resources. If we could get our hands on it, we can build a bigger navy than our current 230 ships and an army with thousands of tanks. Think about it your highness. Think about it. Thousands upon thousands of tanks rolling through no man's land as we smash through the Magasian defenses. Hundreds of ships shelling their coastal defenses while they try to feebly counter fire? With an army and navy like that, the Magasians will stand no chance. We need to subjugate that nation on the Formidon continent as quickly as possible. A seemingly crazed man was talking to the Emperor. That crazed man was the war advisor and head general of the mock military. We can send a naval squadron to do that. Sir, just a naval squadron is not enough. We need to send soldiers to completely subjugate the land. Then send BAME soldiers. Why include the BAMEs? We can send our own soldiers. Have you forgotten what happened when my great-grandfather tried to take over that continent? Thousands of Machian soldiers were slaughtered when the birds appeared. Only the navy was able to escape. I'm not doing a repeat of that. We're sending a naval squadron with soldiers from BAME. We can spare some resources as a reward for their kingdom's participation. As you wish your majesty. I will prepare a squadron and notify the BAME of our intentions. A note from Ron the Black Cat. Rifle. AG-2, apparatus gun which is Latin for machine gun. Industro-2. Has a slightly bigger gun than shown in the picture. The picture shows a 37mm instead of a 40mm. Desmond class battleship. Maximil Figther. Chapter 7, Become Our Vassal State. 1000, Early Hour, Quiet 94th, 195A. Primopolis, Septentrio Magus Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. News about how the meeting went with the Americans and the information gained about the Americans were reported to Emperor Arstant. I suppose we can agree to their non-aggression pact. 
Even though Robertus was only a messenger, he was also a close friend and advisor. He may not have as much experience as the actual older advisors and he may get easily excited but he is bright. Your Majesty, if I may express my opinion, go ahead. I believe that they might have refused because the required payment might be a bit too high. You have always expressed that casca. It definitely wasn't because of this. According to the report, Jacques told me that the United States wasn't willing to agree to our defense treaty because they felt that this will get them involved in wars. You should also think about the reason why our payment is so high. The reason why we have that payment is because of the stress on our imperium and the resources we have to expand. We are like a world police that ensures the safety of the other nations. We must accomplish this duty while still taking care of our own country. Why must our Imperium be like a world police? Well Cascus, the reason is that there is no other nation strong enough to counter the mock who is the criminal. If there were, I would gladly let them take care of the world. I myself am getting tired of always having to keep the mock in check. If only there was another country. 1500 September 5th, 2019 CE. Washington DC, United States of America, Formidon Continent. President Hayes was enjoying a nice glass of sweet tea in his office and was looking over various reports. Sheesh. I'm tired. All I wanted was a quiet term to serve and lead my country. At least nothing else is happening and things are going great. Fuel problems are resolved. Relations with other nations in this world are being established. The phoenixes have been pushed back to the ridges of the northern frontier and companies have begun setting up mines and other things there. Some people have even started to settle the land. A defining feature of the American past. The Wild West. I wonder if the northern frontier can be something like that. A revival of a defining feature of American history. There are some minor issues as of right now but nothing too major. Some people are protesting the massacre of the phoenixes and some companies have been impacted badly from being cut off from our original world. Nothing too bad. Congress is also passing quite a few laws. I was very surprised at the amount. Usually, it takes them ages to get something passed. The most important of them would probably be the Technology Safeguard Act. Just something to make sure we maintain technological supremacy. I hope this calm goes on. As my motto says work hard and fix everything first, then be lazy. I will be so unhappy if someone tried to invade us or start a war or something. Unknown to the president, he's going to be very unhappy very soon. Somewhere in the ocean between the Bame Kingdom and Formidon at night. Two fleets of ships were making their way towards the Formidon continent. Accompanying the Machian squadron is 20 Bame ships of the line carrying 2,000 soldiers. The BAME ships of the line were in a columnar formation. On the flagship, a BAME admiral in his quarters was drinking some liquor with his vice admiral. Dam Mock thinking they can do whatever they want and Dem King licking their feet. Admiral, those are treasonous words, but I do agree. This is a suicide mission. A nation on Formiden. Pfft. Last I heard, it was infested with man-eating birds. The admiral downed a glass of liquor and continued rambling. He was missing his family and home. The people hate that the king listens to the mock. The mock literally is the king of our king. We can't do shit. He drank another glass and slammed it down. Further ahead of the BAME fleet was the ships of the mock. On a Desmond-class battleship. Another admiral was talking with his close aides. They were enjoying some fine wine. This will probably be an easy conquest. A bunch of savages that just sprouted up as a nation after the birds disappeared. The Machian diplomat among them joined in. Although they are a bunch of savages, we are still required to try to make them a vassal state. Wastes fewer resources than fighting them. Of course, I do hope that they disagree so we can show them the might of our glorious Imperium. To our Imperium. The people in the rooms raised their cups. Glory to our Imperium. May it last a thousand years. Unknown to them, the mock Imperium will probably not last another year. In a random bar in Industropolis on the same night. The room was filled with people talking about various things. It ranged from personal matters to current state affairs. 
A common topic was the nation on Formidon. It started after people noticed and spread the news of the gathering of ships at Port Bannock. The emperor wasn't that concerned about keeping it a secret so it soon got out that there was a nation on Formidon. Two men, acquaintances from work, had begun talking about it. Finally with this, we can win against those pigs. I don't understand how conquering a bunch of savages will help us against the magus. You numbskull. Is there only air in that brain of yours? The reason why we wanted to conquer that continent in the past and now is the resources. Whatever, I relatively don't care about this politics stuff. As long as it doesn't affect me. On the subject of me being a numbskull, does your wife know you're here? 0930 September 6, 2019 C. 0545, early hour, quiet 98th, 195 A. Miami, United States of America, Formidon Continent. Diplomat Underwood and translator Hoffman had came to the temporary Magasian embassy after Ambassador Jacques called him about urgent matters. Our spies say that a Mackian naval squadron consisting of around 30 warships are sailing towards you. Do you know what their intent is? We aren't quite sure but we believe that they may be on their way to invade you. 0950 September 6, 2019 CE, Washington DC, United States of America, Formidon Continent. We need you in the Situation Room now. This is urgent. I got a bad feeling about this. A few minutes later in the situation room. Great. I really shouldn't have thought of that yesterday. The president and the rest of the National Security Council learned that the Magasians had intelligence about a possible Mackian invasion. Currently satellites were trying to find out whether or not this was true. 1112 September 6, 2019 CE. They were looking at satellite images depicting a total of 52 ships. 32 ships were in a group and all made of metal while another 20 ships were in a group behind and seemed to be made of wood. Krilson was explaining. At around 1050, this morning, our satellites spotted two formations of ships in the middle of the ocean between our continent and the Impertoria continent. We believe it's a mix of BAME and Mackian warships. They seem to be sailing directly towards Miami. Everyone showed faces of concern. The president was asking questions. How long will it take them to get here? It is predicted that it will take them about 14 days. The Mackian ships have greatly reduced their speeds to somewhat match with the BAMES. What do we think their intention is? It doesn't seem peaceful. Seeing that they are a group of heavily armed warships. According to the Magasians, it is hostile. 1500 September 6, 2019 CE 0730, mid-hour, quiet 98th, 195A, Miami, United States of America, Formidon Continent. Diplomat Underwood, I believe it is in your country's best interest in accepting the Mutual Defense Treaty. I have said it many times. My country has absolutely no interest in that. The Mackian will probably back down if they know they will immediately have to go to war with us if they attack you. Agree to the treaty and your country is saved. Our country is able to defend itself. Then I will have to leave. I believe it isn't safe for me to be here. However, I will leave behind some minimal personnel to maintain contact. Then I hope we can meet again. Ambassador Jacques got up and left with a solemn face. 1323 September 20, 2019 CE. 0641, mid-hour. Quiet 112th, 195A, Miami, United States of America, Formidon Continent. A few days ago, the United States went into DEFCON 3. Most Magasians and all the Albines have left. However, a group of four very low rank Magasians have been left behind with some communication equipment. They were ordered to escape and destroy the equipment if the Americans failed to stop the Machians. A few miles away from Miami, Admiral Publius was looking out the bridge. Within an hour, they would arrive. While looking through his binoculars, he noticed something that was approaching at a very fast speed. He focused on it and waited for it to approach. 
It didn't seem like the man-eating bird. As it got closer he identified it as a weird aircraft. Instead of the propellers being in front of the aircraft, it was above. All the others in the bridge started to notice it. People started murmuring to each other. What is that? I don't know. Admiral Publius took the initiative. Put everyone on alert. Prepare for battle. A few minutes later, the weird aircraft was only a few miles away. A loud voice came out of it. We request, on behalf of our government, that you advance no further. We will allow one of your ships to dock and explain. I repeat, this is the United States Armed Forces. We request, on behalf of our government, that you advance no further. We will allow one of your ships to dock and explain. Admiral, what do we do? Let our ship advance. Communicate to the others to stay behind. Couldn't this be a trap? That weird aircraft could be using it as a chance to destroy our ship and escape before the others can catch up. We could just all advance forward and blow them apart. Do you doubt the power of a ship named after our emperor? That aircraft will be blown out of the sky if they do anything. Our diplomat wanted to open up negotiations first before any action. The Desmond-class battleship started to move forward. 1410 September 20, 2019 CE. 0705, mid-hour, quiet 112, 195 AE. Miami, United States of America, Formidon Continent. There were news crews and civilians everywhere. The people were being kept back by police and military. This was receiving much more coverage and much earlier than the Albines and Magasians because of the obvious military buildup in the surrounding area. When the Albines and Magasians came, it was more unexpected and the government tried to keep it low. There was a bit of news coverage after people noticed. This time it was different. Diplomat Underwood was there to greet the Machians. The Desmond-class battleship had just docked. Two well-dressed men accompanied by ten sailors carrying rifles got off. Diplomat Underwood greeted them. One of the well-dressed men spoke. I'm Admiral Publius of the Machian Navy and this is Diplomat Felix. We would like for you to hear our proposal. Translator Hoffman was also there and explained it to Underwood. Diplomat Felix handed a paper to Underwood who gave it to Hoffman. Basically we want you to become our vassal state. Diplomat Underwood raised an eyebrow after Hoffman translated what was said. Chapter 8, It Has Begun. 1414 September 20, 2019 CE. 0707, Mid-Hour, Quiet 112, 195 A. Miami, United States of America, Formidon Continent. Hoffman, are you sure you translated that correctly? I'm pretty sure that is what he said. Make him repeat it. Hoffman asked. Diplomat Felix started gloating. Ah, uh, I might not have been clear. Our generous and almighty mock imperium have given you barbarians a chance to become a vassal state of our glorious country. It would be wise to accept. Hoffman translated and also explained the contents of the papers that were handed to him. This treaty is basically what he had just said. It also adds certain conditions. Something along the lines of complete obedience and high amounts of tribute. They want us to become a vassal state to their country. Diplomat Underwood looked towards Diplomat Felix with a calm face. Our country will not become a vassal state to your country. We have already refused the mutual defense treaty given to us by the Magasians. We would like to stay neutral to any conflicts that you two countries may have. The United States of America will not agree to any proposal that is against its interests. Diplomat Felix started to sound more and more threatening. Then that is really regretful. We have given you barbarians the great honor of being able to ally yourselves with us. Since you have refused, the Mock Imperium and Ben Kingdom hereby declare war on you. However, we are merciful people. You have 12 hours, 24 hours in our time, to surrender. If we get no response within that time frame, our fleet will invade. We will burn this city down to the ground and kill every single one of your people. After the Machians departed, Diplomat Underwood stood there with an extremely and uncanny calm face. Contact Washington. 
1500 September 20, 2019 CE, 0730, mid-hour, quiet 112th, 195 AE, many miles off the shores of Miami, Admiral Publius was talking to diplomat Felix when they returned to the rest of the fleet. Diplomat, are you sure about this? The aircraft they used earlier seemed to be advanced. Admiral, I know the situation of the world. No country other than the Magasians can put up resistance that can stop us. Sure their aircraft with the propeller on top may seem advanced, in reality, it is inferior to our aircraft. It doesn't have any weapons on it and it seems less maneuverable compared to our Maximil fighters. It is not fit for air-to-air -air combat or anything else in particular. These Americans might have created it because it was easy to make. The anti-air cannons on our ships can easily deal with it. As a military man, the Admiral has some doubts but didn't question the superiority of his Imperium. Unknown to them, they were already surrounded. 1500 September 20, 2019 CE, somewhere. Commander, they are well within the range of our torpedoes. We can blast every single one of them out of the water within mere minutes. The commander was stern and focused on the radar screen. Washington hasn't given the go-ahead yet. Hidden underwater near the BAME and Mackian fleet was Submarine Squadron 6 and Submarine Squadron 4. It consisted of a total of six Los Angeles-class and seven Virginia-class nuclear attack submarines. Out of sight but close to the BAME and Mackian fleet was also two carrier strike groups. This was a total of two Nimitz-class nuclear aircraft carriers, two Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruisers, and four R. Lee Burke-class guided missile destroyers. There was also an additional six R. Lee Burke-class guided missile destroyer present as an engagement force. The submarines have four torpedo tubes each and have a large number of torpedoes in stock. The Mark 45 5-inch, 127 mm, guns and Mark 41 vertical launching systems of the cruisers and destroyers were ready. F-A-18E-F Super Hornets were also ready for liftoff from the USS George Washington, CVN-73, and USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, CVN-69. F-35A Lightning IIS from multiple Air Force bases across Florida were preparing as extra support. The fighter jets were loaded with a variety of air-to-surface missiles and guided bomb units, GBU. 1420 September 20, 2019 CE, 0710, mid-hour, quiet 112th, 195 AE, Washington, D.C., United States of America, Formidon Continent. The president was on his phone in the Situation Room. After a few more minutes of talking, the president got off the phone. Get us to DEFCON 2. I'm going to need to inform the people about our current situation. Mr. President, news outlets have already had Latin translators translate what was said. The people know and they are outraged. 1445 September 20, 2019 CE, 0722, mid-hour, quiet 112th, 195 AE, a random news station. News stations across America were in a frenzy. In channels that report news, all other programming was pushed back for this breaking news. Here is an example from a news channel. I'm Martin Sods. We are interrupting this broadcast to bring you breaking news of a possible declaration of war against the United States. At around 2.10, this afternoon, a ship representing the Mock Imperium and Bame Kingdom arrived in Port Everglades. This was also the place where the Albines and Magasians docked less than a month earlier and established a good relationship with the United States. A labeled political map appeared on the screen that labeled the countries. From our translators, we were able to learn that the people who represented the Mock Imperium and Bame Kingdom immediately demanded the United States of America to become a vassal state of the Mock Imperium. Of course, our diplomat immediately refused. Then the representative of the Mock Imperium and Bame Kingdom proceeded to declare war on the United States. The representative said that they were willing to wait for 24 hours for a response from the United States Gover. 
I'm getting word that the president is making an announcement. This is live footage of the president's address on this situation. The screen switched to the president behind a podium. My fellow Americans, at around 2 p.m. Eastern Time today, our diplomats made contact with diplomats representing the Mach Imperium and Bame Kingdom. They gave us the offer of becoming their vassal state and when we refused, they threatened us with a war within 24 hours if we did not submit. As we speak, there is a Mackian and Bame fleet positioned right outside of U.S. territorial waters near Florida and are ready to advance. However, the U.S. Navy is positioned and ready to strike if they dare enter American waters. Although we want peace, we do not believe that peace is so sweet as to be purchased at the cost of our liberty. As of right now, we will try to resolve this peacefully and request that they advance no further. May God bless the United States of America. 1500 September 20, 2019 CE. 0730, mid-hour, quiet 112th, 195 AE. Washington, D.C. United States of America, for Maiden Continent. The president was in the Situation Room and was viewing live footage from a surveillance drone. An RQ-4 Global Hawk was flying far above the Mackian and Bame fleet while recording and sending live footage to the Situation Room. Mr. President, all our forces are in place and ready to strike. Tell them that we will never agree to their demands and that they will be fired upon if they try to proceed any further. 1520 September 20, 2019 CE. 0710, mid-hour, quiet 112th, 195 AE. Many miles off the shores of Miami. Admiral, another plane seems to be incoming. I hope that they are wise and agree to our demands. It would be a real pity if they didn't. We will never agree to your terms. We request that you send a single ship for further negotiations. We will open fire if all of your ships advance. I repeat we will open fire if all ships advance. The Admiral was looking out the bridge. Diplomat, what do we do? Per the King's instructions, if they refuse we will attack. Commence the attack Admiral. Admiral Publius turned back to his sailors. Let's ignore that puny aircraft. We are heading straight for their city. Signal for all ships to advance. 1525 September 20, 2019 CE. 0733, mid-hour, quiet 112th, 195 A. Washington, D.C., United States of America, for Maiden Continent. On the screen, the ships started to advance. The Sikorsky SH-60 Seahawk helicopter was staying a distance away from the ships and was ready to pull back if they were fired upon. Strangely, even though the ships all started to advance, the ships ignored it. The president was confused as to why the helicopter wasn't fired upon but decided to warn the Mackian and BAME again. He had also already been informed about what U.S. naval units were positioned there. Tell the helicopter to warn them again. Also get the engagement force and fire warning shots if they do not desist. 1530 September 20, 2019 CE. 0745, mid-hour, quiet 112th, 195 A. Many miles off the shores of Miami. I repeat do not advance any further. The messages from the aircraft were ignored. The two Desmond-class battleships were going at its top speed of 23.6 miles per hour towards the city. Going at top speed will go through a lot of coal but they had already been replenished by colliers. A sailor on the Desmond-class battleship noticed something. Admiral, we have multiple ships sighted over the horizon to our left. Let them approach. When they get within 10 miles, our ship and the other Desmond-class battleship will open fire. The Admiral was calm since no known ship of that time could outrange the Desmond-class battleship. Being one of the most advanced ships of its time, it had a maximum firing range of about 10 miles. They could pummel any ship that dares try to get close. 1530 September 20, 2019 CE. 0745, mid-hour, quiet 112th, 195 AE. 
Many miles off the shores of Miami, Commander, we have spotted the Mackian and BAME fleet. The commander of the Arleberg class destroyer got on his radio with the other commanders. Once we get into range, we will each fire a warning shot and then disengage. The Arleberg class destroyers were going at a top speed of 35 miles per hour and were quick long approaching its effective firing range of 15 miles. It could fire up to 20 miles but wasn't 100% accurate beyond 15 miles. It also could fire 16 to 20 rounds per minute automatic. Of course after exhausting 16 to 20 rounds, it will take time to reload. 1545 September 20, 2019 CE, 0752, mid-hour, quiet 112, 195 A. Many miles off the shores of Miami. Admiral, they opened fire. Opened fire? What does the rangefinder indicate? They are about 14 to 15 miles out, sir. Those are probably warning shots. Those can't get anywhere near us. Right after saying that, six pillars of water rose up around the fleet. The admiral was flabbergasted. What? Impossible? To have a range of more than 10 miles? Is that rangefinder accurate? It is, sir. Turn back now or we will be forced to fire with intentions to sink. I repeat turn back now. Both Desmond-class battleships had its guns pointed towards the six ships that had opened fire on them. However, they were way out of range and seemed to have no interest in getting closer. Admiral, what do we do? Press forward? They don't seem to fire accurately and seems to take time to reload. 1550 September 20, 2019 CE, 0755, mid-hour, quiet 112, 195 A, hidden under the ocean near the Mackian and Bame fleet. Washington has given the go-ahead. They want us to sink the two battleships. Chapter 9 Part 1, One-Sided Naval Battle. 1555 September 20, 2019 CE, 0752, mid-hour, quiet 112, 195 A. Many miles off the shores of Miami. Press forward. Show no fear. For the glory of the Imperium. The majestic and invincible steel beast of his Imperium was going full speed along with its fleet. Admiral Publius's eyes filled with determination as it always does when he goes into battle mode. All of a sudden, the ship violently rocked to the left and everyone on the bridge was thrown off balance. There was a massive and brilliant explosion on the right of the ship. The admiral was thrown to the ground. He was only dealt with a couple of scrapes and stood up soon after. What in his majesty's name was that? As everyone started to recover and assess the situation, an officer shouted out. Admiral, our ship was hit and is listing to the right. What hit us? It could be a torpedo. We are currently taking on large amounts of water. Can it be repaired? No, sir, the hole is too big. Just as that was said, there was a massive flash behind them. What was that? Sir, the IS, Imperium ship, Atticus, our other battleship, was hit. What's its condition? We don't can. Use the telegraph. A telegraph was immediately sent to the IS Atticus. A reply came a few minutes later. Admiral, it reads listing right. Taking on water. Unrepairable. Preparing to abandon. What kind of torpedo can do that? Where are they firing from? We don't know, Admiral. We believe that it's a submarine but the destroyers have not detected anything. Try anything to repair the damage. The Admiral was beginning to panic. Admiral, it's impossible, water is gushing in so fast that our men can't seal it off. The Admiral started to sweat. A, ab, abandon, ship. A minute ago, nearby under the sea. After given the go-ahead, one torpedo came out from each of the six Los Angeles-class nuclear attack submarines. Three of the torpedoes headed to one of the battleships while the other three headed to the other battleship. The Virginia-class nuclear attack submarine did not fire. The government wanted them to surrender for some political reason. 1600 September 20, 2019 CE, 0800, mid-hour, 
quiet 112th, 195A, many miles off the shores of Miami. Captain, our flagships IS Marcus and IS Atticus is sinking? We are receiving a telegraph message from the IS Atticus that they are abandoning ship. The captain of the heavy cruiser Victorum, third in command of the fleet, was taken by surprise. The other officers in the bridge were terrified. In mere minutes of the order to attack, both of their flagships were sinking. Their flagships, the Desmond-class battleship, should be able to take any heavy fire from any navy and still stay operational. There were no munitions capable of sinking it in a mere few shots. Even the Magasian navy, the only navy capable of somewhat standing up to the mock, could not face any Desmond-class battleship with any hope of winning unless they outnumbered it 20 to 1. Now, right in front of their eyes, these invincible beasts were sinking. Captain, what do we do? Should we turn back? We can't press forward. The captain had a solemn face. Telegraph to the other mock ships to retreat. Should we signal to the BAME to do that too? We got no time. Retreat as fast as possible. The BAME will stay behind to cover our retreat. The captain of the heavy cruiser Victorium knew that it was less of a cover and more of a sacrifice. Captain, we must go save the survivors. We will meet the same fate as our flagships if we do. Ignore the survivors. But captain. The captain gave a stern look and the opposing officer backed down. The group of heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers were turning around in a scattered position. Far behind them, the BAME fleet which had seen the destruction of the Machian's battleships noticed it. Admiral, they are turning around. Have they signaled to us their intentions? Negative sir. They are abandoning us, aren't they? Those bastards. The six R. Lieberg class destroyers that were staying 15 miles out also noticed. We have just received orders to intercept and prevent their escape. Focus fire on the Machian ships. I, I. Sir. The gun on each of the destroyers immediately turned and fired on the ships that were in the front of the Machian formation. At that moment on the IS Victorum. Captain? The enemies have opened fire. Try to evade. The IS Victorum was hit. So were five other Machian ships. Two destroyers were immediately obliterated upon impact. A light cruiser's bridge was destroyed. Another heavy cruiser and the IS Victorum sustained heavy damage. The ears of the captain of the IS Victorum were ringing from the explosion. What's the situation? Captain? The enemy shell hit the center of the ship. Two of our side main guns have been destroyed. All of a sudden, a zooming sound could be heard coming from above and passing over. The captain looked out to the left of the ship. He could see two arrowheads at incredible speeds going outwards. What is that? Multiple Machians noticed the arrowheads flying over by and were alarmed by it. Its speed was something that seemed to be impossible. At that moment on the IS Marcus, Admiral Publius's was grimly looking out of the bridge. The rest of the crew and the diplomat had abandoned ship. Based on Machian naval tradition, an admiral cannot abandon ship. If they did, they will have their title stripped and face mockery while in jail waiting to be executed. Admiral Publius firmly believed in death before dishonor. What is this? What in his majesty's name is this? The admiral said these words in despair after witnessing the destruction of multiple mock ships and the arrowheads flying by. Chapter 9 Part 2 One-Sided Naval Battle 1616 September 20, 2019 CE 0808 Mid-Hour Quiet 112th 195A. Many miles off the shores of Miami. We have to get out of here. Increase speed. Evasive maneuvers. Put out the fire. They are firing again. Impossible? How are they reloading that fast? Brace for impact. A variety of shouts could be heard from the Machian sailors on different ships. A pair of F-18E-F had just conducted a flyby of the ships as a psychological attack to sow fear in the enemy. The R. Lieberg-class destroyers fired again within seconds of firing the first rounds. Explosions rocked the Machian fleet. This time three destroyers, the heavily damaged heavy cruiser which had lost its frontal main gun, another heavy cruiser, 
and the bridge-damaged light cruiser were hit. Two of the three destroyers suffered the same fate as the first two destroyers. The hits had nearly evaporated them. The third destroyer was hit in the middle and broke in two. It sunk like a closing claw. The damaged heavy cruiser caught fire and the undamaged one exploded because of a hit to the ammunition. Through all of this carnage, the damaged light cruiser that was hit again miraculously stayed afloat. However, the deck was a burning wreck. On the IS Victorum. Captain, we can't let this go on. We have no ability to fight back. Even if we try to escape, we would all be sunk. The captain of the IS Victorum was looking out at the condition of his fleet. Multiple ships were sinking. Some ships were in literal flames. Smoke was rising up around the fleet. There was extensive damage to many ships. They are opening fire again. Many miles away, the guns on the ships of the enemy fleet all flashed. Do they not need to reload? Once again, six ships were hit. The accuracy of the enemy scared the Machians. What kind of gunner was able to perfectly hit their target three times in a row at this distance? It was possible that this was the act of the Magasians using their evil magic. The only thing was, there was no possible magic that can do that. Magic can only conjure things out of thin air and propel it with an invisible force. It can't improve the accuracy of anything. Unknown to them, this was because of the Aegis Weapons System, AWS, that is on every single one of the enemy ships. The AWS uses powerful computer and radar technology to track and guide weapons to destroy enemy targets with near-perfect accuracy. The IS Victorum's back gun was disabled. Four other heavy cruisers suffered extensive damage. A destroyer was hit and was rolling onto its side. The captain of the IS Victorum felt completely hopeless. It was impossible to fight back because the enemy was faster, more accurate, and more destructive than them. The only chance they had was with a complete retreat but even when they were retreating, they were being destroyed as if they were training dummies. Stop all vessels? Quickly? Raise the flag of surrender. On the lead Arleigh Burke. Cease fire? Cease fire. A commander was barking into his radio. The Machian ships had raised white flags and started to slow. The BAME ship of the lines followed suit. The commander was relieved because he was afraid that the tradition for surrender was different in this world. Turns out there was something about the white flag that made it suited for being a symbol of surrender. Although the BAME had not been fired upon, they were too slow to escape. Naval Battle of Florida. Machian Casualties. Sunk slash dead. Two Desmond-class battleships. One heavy cruiser. Six destroyers. About 5,000 men. Captured. Seven heavy cruisers, six heavily damaged. Two light cruisers, one extremely damaged. Fourteen destroyers. About 7,000 men. BAME casualties. Captured. Twenty BAME ship of the line. 16,000 men. American casualties. Zero. Zero 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 September 21 th. 2019 CE. 0300, early hour, quiet 113th, 195 A. Primo Polis, Septentrio Magus Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. Your Majesty. Yes, I'm right next to you, Robertus, you don't have to scream. Ah, uh, yes, Your Majesty. Sorry about that? It's fine, it's fine. What is it? Is it about how our secret military buildup on the front is going? About that your majesty, we have received a telegram from diplomat Jacques. Turns out we don't need to prepare a preemptive invasion of the mock. What do you mean? Turns out the Machian weren't able to defeat the Americans. According to the telegram, diplomat Jacques returned to Formido after receiving, from the people he had left behind to spy on the occupying Machian forces that the American Navy was able to one-sidedly defeat the Machian fleet. Emperor Arstant was surprised. Give me that telegram. The Emperor was handed it and read through it. This is Diplomat Jacques. I have just returned to the continent of Formido. The American Navy was able to one-sidedly defeat the Machian fleet of two Desmond-class battleships, eight heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and twenty destroyers. 
The Americans gave us video footage of the battle. A Mackian fleet of this size would be able to easily threaten our coast. I hate to admit this but this United States of America is more advanced than any country in this world. Maybe the elves are on PAR with them, if the elves exist. When I first set foot in this country, I immediately noted that it was on PAR with ours. They had cars, skyscrapers, and their rich wore comfortable clothing. However, as I stayed longer in it, I noticed that they may have been more advanced than us. Their cars felt smoother and more enjoyable to ride in. Their skyscrapers seem to tower above ours. Their buildings are able to effectively keep warmth in when it is cold outside without the use of any heating equipment. Everyone in their country seems to be able to wear good clothing. They even have the ability to produce colored video footage. My list can go on and on. By then I believed that they may have been a bit better than us. I believed that we may have been only a step behind. Now, I believe that they may be hundreds of years ahead of us. I have been trying my best to pretend that I wasn't surprised by any of their better technology in order for us to gain negotiations that favored us. Now I realized my mistake. The moment we arrived was the moment that they knew we were less advanced. In my opinion, we can't dare to anger them. They will be a more fearsome enemy than the mock. Chapter 10, Calm Before the Storm. 0020 September 21 th, 2019 CE. 0310, Early Hour, Quiet 113, 195 A. Primo Polis, Septentrio Magus Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. Emperor Colriu's Arstant was stroking his white beard. I'm not sure whether to be happy or apprehensive. Robertus looked at the telegram on the table thoughtfully. I agree. I'm happy that the mock wasn't able to gain the resources that the Formidan continent had but I'm now worried about the United States of America. They could potentially be a threat. They did just wipe out a mock fleet able to conquer a country in the League of Soan within days. It's a good thing we agreed to a non-aggression pact. But your majesty, will they uphold it? Emperor Arstan looked at the ceiling of his office room. I believe so. From what diplomat Jacques has said, they haven't acted aggressively at all towards us. They only attacked the mock to defend themselves, this might actually work in our favor. 1200 September 21 th, 2019 CE. 0900, and hour, quiet 113, 195 AE. Primo Polis, Septentrio Magus Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. Emperor Arstand was back in his office room. Most would think that being the emperor was very easy. All you had to do was sit in your throne room, look all high and mighty, and command your subordinates. That was completely false. Although he did get to sit in his throne room for official ceremonies, granting audiences, or conducting large meetings. Small meetings, decisions, and paperwork in his office room filled up a large part of the day. The most annoying part of being emperor was the paperwork. He had to look through various reports, complaints, and random things that ranged from taxes to military information. It was tiring work. Of course, there were good sides to being emperor. Good food, great entertainment, and time to relax. He did just have a nice steak dinner. Your Majesty. It was Robertus again. Your Majesty, we have another magram from Diplomat Jacques. It seemed like all the recent news from him was about the United States of America. Give it to me. Emperor Arstant, as usual, skipped the formalities that were usually included on magrams sent to the Emperor and looked through the content. This is Diplomat Jacques. The United States of America has established contact with the Machians using the telegrams on the Machian ships. Interestingly, the Machians seem to have developed a type of telegram that doesn't require wires. The United States wants to pursue a peaceful resolution with the Machians after the Machians' unreasonable declaration of war. They are also willing to release and send back the about 7,000 Machian prisoners of war that they have captured. Your Majesty, if we can get the United States of America to fight the Machians, then won't we benefit from it? Of course it will. 
Then can we somehow sabotage the communications to make it look like the Machians are being hostile? I don't think there's a need for that. What do you mean? Robert Tuz, it's the Machians we are talking about. About an hour earlier. Jacksonville, Florida, United States of America, Formide Incontinent. Can you send a telegram to your country? The Machian diplomat, Diplomat Felix, was sitting in the communication room of a Machian destroyer. He was a survivor of the IS Marcus and was picked up by the US Navy after the battle. The Machian destroyer was docked at the Mayport base along with other captured Machian ships. Diplomat Underwood, Translator Hoffman, and a bunch of American officials and soldiers were around him. We need you to tell your emperor the news of your defeat and our willingness to negotiate. Sure, anything specific. Diplomat Felix was extremely bitter but didn't complain. He saw firsthand the power of these Americans. 1200 September 21 th, 2019 CE. 1000, down hour, quiet 113, 195 A. Primo Polis, Septentrio Magus Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. Industropolis, Mach Imperium, Domum, Imperatoria, Continent. Message for Emperor Industras. Your Imperial Highness, I, Diplomat Felix, your humble servant, has a message of utmost importance to you. Yesterday, our invasion fleet was defeated. The Americans had sunk two battleships, one heavy cruiser, and six destroyers. They have captured the entire BAME and remaining Machian fleet and have 7,000 of your subjects as prisoners including me. The Americans suffered neither casualties nor damage. The Americans have allowed me to use the telegram installed in the communication room of a Machian destroyer to report this to you and extend their offer of negotiations. The Americans are willing to see this as a misunderstanding and they wish to stop the current state of war, which I had declared, between our nation and theirs. They are also willing to further discuss this if you deem it necessary. They promise to keep the Machian prisoners of war in good condition and release them after the state of war ceases. Your Imperial Highness, I have seen the might of the United States of America and implore that you agree to their request for peace. May your reign never end. An extremely unpleasant and enraging look was on Emperor Desmond Industros's face. Summon my advisors now. A scared-looking servant next to the Emperor responded. Why, yes, sir. A few minutes later in the throne room. Can anyone explain how this happened? In his throne room, Emperor Industras was still enraged. One of the advisors spoke up. Sir, the Magasians might have helped the Americans. Two Desmond-class battleships were sunk. Two, the Magasians don't have the weapons to sink them without risking massive damage to themselves. You are telling me that the Magasians had a large fleet there and were willing to risk that fleet to protect an unknown country. Your Highness. What? It was because of incompetence. The Emperor looked towards the military advisor slash head general Flavius Tulas. Hmm. The incompetence of the sailors and their officers doomed the fleet? There can be no other sensible reason? Think about it, Your Highness. Because their guards were down. They were easily attacked and defeated. The Emperor's eyes narrowed. Then what about these words written by Diplomat Felix? He says that the Americans are terrifying. Lies? Your Majesty? Lies? He has been forced by these barbarians to send this to you? They are threatening us and trying to use this lucky victory to gain from us? They say that they have suffered no damage but that's made up. They even dare say they are treating the prisoners well in order to make us bow down to them for the prisoners' safety? These words are a veiled threat. Silence perpetrated the air. Emperor Industros was thinking about those words and came to heed his trusted military adviser Flavius's words. How dare they try to make fools out of our empire with their promise of negotiation? Prepare a massive fleet? We will wipe them out? Tell these barbarians that they have a day to surrender or we will eradicate every last one of them. 1240 September 21 th, 2019 CE. 0620, mid-hour, quiet 113, 195 A. Jacksonville, Florida, United States of America.
Formide incontinent. A reply came through. You have within a day to send us your unconditional surrender. This is your last chance. A massive fleet bigger than the first one will be sent and you will suffer the consequences. Choose wisely. The first option is that you surrender and become our vassal state with minor consequences for your actions. Or, you don't and face the wrath of our imperial military. We will kill your soldiers, lay waste to your puny towns, massacre every single one of your people. None shall be spared. 1250 September 21 th 2019 CE 0625 mid hour quiet 113 195 A Washington DC United States of America for Maiden continent President Ronel Hay had a somewhat unimpressed somewhat straight face most of the people in the situation room knew what kind of face it was the president only showed that face when he was extremely infuriated and extremely was an understatement no one, no one, threatens the American people. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Daniel Marks, was in the Situation Room because of the current situation. Mr. President, we need immediate military action. The president slowly nodded. 1400 September 21 th, 2019 CE, 0700, mid-hour, quiet 113th. 195 A.E. Washington, D.C., United States of America, Formide Incontinent. Army General Abrams Thompson, former commander of the U.S. Central Command, was currently in Washington, D.C. He became a former commander after the United States was transported to this world because there was no Middle East anymore. However, he was still in charge of the assets and bases that were from the Middle East. Those were located in the northern frontier. Currently, since the time it took to get home was considerably shorter, he had already saved up to 42 days of leave, and the situation in the northern frontier had stabilized, he decided to take a short vacation. Originally, he would have never gone on vacation at this time because he was in the forward headquarters in the Middle East, not in the main headquarters at the MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. He was watching television with his wife when the phone rang. I will get that. He stood from his couch and walked over to the table with the landline telephone. This is the Thompson household. Yes. You have been ordered to report to the Pentagon. General Thompson felt a bit sad. Understood. He hung up and went over to his wife. He leaned over the couch and gave his wife a kiss to the forehead. He sighed. I need to report to the Pentagon. Something's happening. It's probably related to yesterday. Honey, you haven't even been home for a day. You promised the kids that you will spend some time with them after they got back home. Thompson sighed again. Duty calls? A few minutes later. After getting dressed, he was at the front door adjusting his cap and preparing to leave. His wife stood there leaning on a doorway's side. Come back soon honey. I will, as soon as possible. Tell the kids that I will take them to an amusement park or something when I'm back. 30 minutes later. Pentagon, United States of America, Formide Incontinent. General Thompson saluted at the doorway leading into an office in the Pentagon. Mr. President, General Marks. What may I do for you too? General Thompson was a bit surprised that the President was at the Pentagon. The Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, General Marks, looked up. Ah, General Thompson, come in, take a seat. I was just discussing with the President about our current ops plan. Thompson came in and took a seat opposite of the President and General Marks. The President was still looking through various papers that were displayed on the table between the seats so General Marks started. General Thompson, you may be wondering why you were called in on a day that you were taking a vacation. Um, yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure you have heard of what happened yesterday right? The naval battle off of Florida. You know the details correct. I'm pretty sure I know as far as the news know. The declaration of war by these countries called the Bayman Mock, the one-sided naval battle that occurred where we crushed them, and the prisoners of war and captured ships we obtained. General Marks nodded. About three hours ago, 
We were able to send a telegram message to the Machians using a telegram in a Machian destroyer and with the help of captured Machian diplomat. Hey, raise the translated paper copy of that message. The last sentence was added by the diplomat. General Thompson looked over it. And, well, in about 40 minutes, a reply from the Machians came. Hey, raise the translated copy. Oh, then the president who had been just looking at documents, spoke up. Well, former commander of the U.S. Central Command, you have been appointed the commander of the new U.S. New World Command. Congratulations. I hope you do well with the war on BAME and MOCK. Huh.